الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رسائت أفتمي الصلاة والسلام عليك يا رسول الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا نبي الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا نور الله نويت سنة الاعتكاف The Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم once he was sitting on the member shrif and that specific member had three steps and when he took the first step he said he, he said to himself may he be destroyed when he took the second step he said again may he be destroyed and then on the third step he said once again may he be destroyed the companions asked ya rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that may who be destroyed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam replies that oh companions right now when i took the first step on the member jibril alaihi salam said to me and he made this statement what did jibril alaihi salam say jibril alaihi salam said that, that person whose parents become old and are still displeased with him so when jibril alaihi salam said this i said may he be destroyed that was on the first step the second step jibril alaihi salam said that that person upon whom ramadan comes ramadan leaves and is still not forgiven prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said may he be destroyed and the third time when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the third step that he took jibril alaihi salam said upon that person whom your name is recited upon and he doesn't read the rushdi that person your name is recited upon him and he doesn't read the rushdi the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said may he be destroyed as well and this is the most important one the one when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's name is read as a Muslim he must read the rushdi when someone says Muhammad naturally we should say sallallahu alaihi wasallam even if we were asleep we were asleep we were unconscious someone said Muhammad it should be on our tongue sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Lahore some man passed away he used to read 10000 rushdi a day he passed away and you know when because his lips were naturally naturally they were always read the rush reef his entire life his lips were read in the rush reef and you know when he died his cuff, when he when when they carried his body to the graveyard his lips were moving still read in the rush reef why because he read him he read the rushdi for all his life his lips were used to it even when he died his lips were used to it, used to it that's where the shir comes from mera lasha bhi kahega assalatu wassalam that even my corpse will scream assalatu wassalam we will read the rushdi but now we're in the month of ramadan the month has come the month has gone and who would be dis- destroyed that person the month comes upon the month leaves allah has still not forgiven him prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said let him be destroyed we that person upon ramzan comes who, and how do you figure out whether you are forgiven or not inshallah i'll come to in a moment's time but first understand the importance of ramadan a month that comes a is supposed to strengthen our iman is supposed to make us more spiritual more stronger however ramadan comes ramadan leaves 
But Muslim is exactly the same he was one night before Ramadan had started. On Eid day, Muslim is possibly worse on Eid day than he was one day before Ramadan started. So has Ramadan benefited that person or not? Or is he coming into this uh, category of those that are being destroyed? Allah Azawajalla forgives millions of people at the time of iftari. Millions. Is that person being forgiven? Is that no? Now the question is: A person might think to himself that, "Yeah, I read namaz, I fast, I read my taraweeh, I read my Quran, I do everything that I am supposed to do. I must be forgiven. It's guaranteed forgiveness. You know, those people that don't read namaz, don't fast, they they say to themselves that, "Look, what do I do wrong?" Yeah, I always give charity, I smile at people, I'm good to my parents. But they say to themselves that I do, I do, I don't do any sins. There's nothing for me to be forgiven for. A practicing person, me and you, we read our namaz, we fast, we do everything we are supposed to do. We please our parents, we do umrah, we do itikaf. We say to ourselves, yeah, I must be forgiven. How do you know? Me and you, we don't know until we die. So how can we, you know, even be satisfied that we are forgiven in this month? And how can we be satisfied and how can we sit back and relax knowing that what if we are not forgiven? This month is a month where people who are supposed to go to the fire of hell, they are relieved from the fire of hell. How do you know that you are not? Uh, you are rel relieved from the fire of hell or not? We don't know. It's not guaranteed. We have hope, trust, and we you know believe in Allah's mercy, but still we're not guaranteed that. That means we need to worship even more. We need to increase our ibadat. Those people that don't fast, that don't you know, you will be surprised as well, youngsters, elders, those people. If they, they might even read Juma, they might even read their five namaz, some don't even fast. They make their own excuse. You get all types of different people, different mindsets, different beliefs. They probably read namaz right next to you. But the month, this month has come, is gone. How do we know we're forgiven? Why does this month come? Why does Allah give us this month? You see, this month is, if you understand the idea of this month, is amazing. Allah gives us 30 days to get rid of any bad habits. If a person doesn't read his namaz, he gives us 30 days read your namaz. He removes the shaitan, no more shaitan, read your namaz. He helps you fast as well, eat less. You go to work, you, you know, because you know you're fasting, you're not going to look at bad things. You're not going to swear at people. You're not going to have a road rage. You're not going to backbite someone. You're not going to lie and break promises. This is what Ramazan is for, and it is to calm our souls down. Our full year, our body gets, you know, hyped up. This Ramazan, this month of fasting, month of patience, it puts you back into your place. And it helps you get rid of all them bad habits. If a person didn't used to read the Quran before the month of Ramadan, in the month of Ramadan, now he'll start to read the Quran. It is a spara day. 30 spara in, in, in the month. Full Quran finished. He picks up good habits. This is now his good habits that he is doing. Now, the test is, the test is not Ramadan. Trust me, the test is not. Ramadan is easy because shaitan's not here. Shaitan's locked up. This is not the test. The test is the day of Eid. The test is the day of Eid when shaitan comes back out. 
That's the true test of Ramadan. That now you spend 30 days reading namaz, reading tahajjud, reading tasbih, reading Quran. 30 days without shaitan. That was easy. Shaitan's back in the system now. Let's see how you, you know, win this test now. How, let's see how you succeed in carrying on these good habits. On the day of Eid, the day after Eid, we know as being an imam, being you know in the masjid, like you guys would know as well. Taravi Salah, you'd have loads of people. The last Isha, you know, when it's announced Maghrib time that you know tomorrow is Eid and Eid Jamaat, the first Jamaat will be at eight and the second Jamaat will be at nine. That very same day, it hasn't been 10 minutes, Ramadan is over. You'll hear cars going up and down the road. You'll have the, the main thing is, Isha Namaz will now be back to five, six people again. Isha Namaz will be back to one row in the masjid, as it was for the rest of the year. Before, in, in Ramadan, Shaitan's locked up. And that's the biggest proof Shaitan exists. The Ramadan time, the masjids are full. Soon as shaitan's back out, masjids are empty. If an atheist ever asks, how do you prove shaitan? This is what you tell them. Now come to masjid in Ramadan time. You'll see shaitan does, it does exist. Because he's, not, he's locked up. Come in any other time, come and eat day. Zohar namaz. You'll find one row again. So that's the true test. And a successful Ramadan is where you then things that you've done for 30 days on the first day after Eid, Eid day, you carry on doing the Azhar. Now think about it. If you live to 60, average person lives 60, 70 years old. Some, some people live on till 95 or 100. Some people pass away young. If a person lives till, let's suppose, 60 years, minus 15 years when he was in Balik, for example, 45 years, that's 45 Ramadan, you know, more or less, 45 Ramadan. Now in the first Ramadan, let's suppose he started to read Quran once per day. In the very first, when he was 16, he started to read once para every single day. And on each day, he never stopped. He started on the first para on Eid day. 30 para on the night before Eid. And first para, he started the Quran all over again on the first day of Eid. And like this, the entire year he read one para a day. And next Ramadan, now he's become a habitual. Because every single day he's been reading the Quran. He's been reading one spara every day for one year. That's finishing 12 Quran Epak. Yeah. Now, how old was he? For example, he was 16 years old. That was one good habit he picked up. One good habit. Now, when next Ramadan comes, he already reads the Quran. He already reads the Quran every single day. That's normal for him. He will now try to find something new to do. So let's suppose he reads Tahajjud every morning now. This Ramadan, he makes the intention that I already read my five namaz. I'm going to fast anyway. And now I read my, you know, my, my one spara every single day. Now I'm going to read Tahajjud every single day. And now let's suppose after each day, he carries on reading Tahajjud namaz. That's two years. One Ramadan gave him the Quran. Second Ramadan gave him the Hajjud. Now, let's suppose five Ramadans later, this person, he reads Quran, he reads the Hajjud. He fasts, Nafal fasts as well. He reads Nafal Salah and he reads 10,000 Rushdi per day. This is his five things he's picked up on in five years. Now imagine doing this every single Ramadan for 60 years. Is that person now going to be a successful Muslim? 
You get the idea? This is what Ramadan is for. You pick up your good habits, you get rid of your bad habits. Allah helps you by taking shaitan away. And then when shaitan comes back, he gives you double reward because now shaitan's here. This is the mercy of Allah. Now, how do you find out if your Ramadan is successful? That's the question. How are you going to figure that out? Simple answer. On each day, you'll find out whether your Ramadan is successful or not. If you have changed. One day before this Ramadan, you were one person. On each day, you're going to be another person. That will be your answer. Has Ramadan changed me? That's the question. Has Ramadan changed me? And you'll find out on Eid day and that week, one week after Eid. Has Ramadan changed me or not? Will I carry on my old habits? Will I pick up new habits? Will I read my Quran? And will I carry on keeping nafal fast? Fasting on Monday Sunnah, for example. Will I carry on doing this? Reading namaz with jamaat. Wajib for many people. Will I carry on doing this? It's a question. That's how you will find out whether your Ramadan is successful. And as a Muslim, we should always, you know, these, these moments that we have, we should cherish them. We should make the most out of these moments. And spending them in negligence, here, there, wasting time, playing games, that's a waste. And honestly, you're going to realize it's a waste when you're laying flat in the grave. That's when you realize something was a waste. Anyways, this month is a month of the Quran. That was one part. Ramadan, the blessings of Ramadan. And you know, there's still three days left, four days. That's it's still, you know, there's still time to earn a lot of reward. Laylatul Qadr is here. This Laylatul Qadr is better than a thousand months, thousand, thousands of months. What you do in one Laylatul Qadr, many people don't do in their entire life. The Qur'an descended in Laylatul Qadr. The Qur'an descended in Laylatul Qadr. From the Lawhul Mahfuz to the first sky. Jibreel alayhi salam used to bring it from the first sky. To the Prophet This is a night of power. And Allah you know in the previous nations they would live. I think Adam alayhi salam lived for 960 years. Nuh alayhi salam 1400 uh, 1640 years. That was a long age. And imagine how much worship you could do in that time. 1640 years. That's a long age, isn't it? Now, jinns live that long. Imagine humans living that long. In 60 years, you could do so much. Imagine times 10. Now imagine the worship that person could do. The worship that person could do who lives for a thousand years. Now compare it to us. We, if we, we'd be lucky if we get to 50, 60. Past 50, then you, you got one leg in your grave already. Now Allah has blessed us because now Allah has given certain nights in the Islamic calendar where we could do more good deeds than a person who lives for thousands of years. But we do we make the most of that as well? That's another blessing Allah has given us. This month of the Quran, this entire month is the month of the Quran. Allah has given us this month because the Quran was revealed in this month. And now to respect this month, to honor this month, we, we fast in this month. That's how we honor the Quran or Ramadan. Do we read the Quran? That's the question. I'm going to tell you one story and then inshallah I'll end on that. The Quran, a person who reads the Quran, you know, when he reads the Quran on top of his house, there's a light. Allah makes a light. A noor, a piece of noor emerges, radiates from the roof of his house. And you know the angels of the skies, they, they use this to get around. They use this light to move around the skies. They use it as coordinates, you could say. 
and you know birds birds use it as well sometimes you know people might ask how do birds know how to get from scotland to london how do they know the direction It's because of this nur on top of the houses. If a person reads the Quran, Muslims they have nurs on top of their homes. We can't see it. Birds and angels can see it, and they use this to navigate towards the skies. And now, a person who reads the Quran, if he dies, that nur finishes from his house. That light goes away. It used to be on the roof of his house. Now it's not there anymore. So the bird that's flying past, when he, he or she, the bird realizes that there's no nur on top of the house, the bird realizes, or the angel realizes that he's died. He's died. So the bird and the angels that make dua, Ya Allah, Zajullah, forgive his sins. Convert his bad deeds into good deeds. All the angels make this dua. Now listen, Kev, this, this story is amazing. This is not even the start of the story. That person who would read the Quran, think about it, when you die, what happens? You do the, you wash the person, you give him ghusl, you give him kafan, his shroud, you pour him into a coffin. You know? Imagine that, just think about it for a moment. Being washed, being washed is not something easy. One moment ago, you were eating, drinking, sleeping, laughing, you know, having fun. And now someone's washing you. Imagine how you would feel. Now, whilst that person is being washed, this man, this young boy made out of Noor, Comes and sits next to him. Comes and sits next to him. And just sits there. Smiles at the dead person. And after his ghusl has been given, they put his shroud on him. They go to the... Uh, where they do his janaza. And this person, this, this Nurani creature, he stood there, he's doing the janaza as well. Beautiful, young... Nurani creature thing but he that dead person doesn't know who he is or what he is they do his janaza he's there they go to bury him this person's there as well who is he mysterious once they bury him everyone goes home this creature comes inside the grave bright he lights up the grave and he just stares at him. He stares at the dead person. Imagine that. He's staring at the dead person. The dead person doesn't know who he is. All of a sudden, Munkar and Nakir, you know them angels that come and ask questions in your grave. Marrabbu kama, dinu kama, kunta da kulu fi haki hazur rajul. They, they come into that man's grave. And this Nurani creature, he stops them. He says, come in, but stay there. Don't come any closer. Don't come close to this dead person. Munkar and Nakir, they say, look, we've been sent by Allah. We go into graves. We scare the person and we ask him three questions and we leave. He says, no, not this person. He's a special person. Munkar and Nakir, they say, look, we've got some questions to ask. Let us ask him. They said, look, stand there, ask the questions, then you could go. Don't come closer. What Munkar and Nakir normally do, they come up to you, they tear into your grave, scare the life out of you, then they ask you questions. But this person who reads the Quran, this person in his grave, he stops them, he helps him out. He backs him up. Munkar and Nakir close their books and say, look, if because Munkar and Nakir say to that person that, look, we've been sent by Allah. He says, I've been sent by Allah as well. Munkar and Nakir close the books. They say, look, if he's sent by Allah, then I'm way sent by Allah. He must be a special person. So they close the books. They don't even ask him the questions. Now, this 
Nurani creature turns back around to the dead person inside the grave. And he says to him, do you know who I am? He says, I don't know. You followed me since I died. I don't know who you are. He says, you used to read the Quran in the day, in the night. I used to make you thirsty. I used to make you cry. I used to make you tired. I used to make you smile. And you used to hug me. You used to kiss me. You made me a friend in the dunya. But I couldn't be your friend in the dunya. The Quran says that now you have no friends and family. Now I'm your friend. Now I'm going to back you up. Now I will be that friend that you deserve. That Nurani creature is the Quran. That is sent to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says to him, look, you, I'm going to go to Allah. I'm going to ask him to make your grave big. So the furthest you can see, that's how big this grave is going to be. So far as the eyesight can see. That's big. Imagine how far your eyes, that's the horizon, isn't it? And that's one. Number two, I'm going to ask all the angels to bring bad decorations down from Jannat. Decorate your grave. And I'm going to ask Allah to forgive your sins. Three things. He goes all the way to the skies. He goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's court. And he asks Allah for them three things. Allah forgives his sins. Makes his qabr as far as the eyesight can see. And then also, when he comes back down into the fifth heaven, he grabs 4,000 angels, this Nurani creature, says to the angels that get all the decoration of Jannat. Bring all the, the blankets, the lanterns, the beds, all the silky garments, the perfume. Bring everything. 4,000 angels come into that grave. So you know when this Nurani creature comes back into the grave, he says to the dead person that when I went, did anyone give you any taklif? Did anyone give, cause any sort of um, disharmony in the grave whilst I was gone? He says, no, no, no I'm safe and sound here. So now 4,000 angels decorate his grave. They put lanterns on each side of the grave. They make his bed from silk and heavenly garments. His, gar his, his grave now is a beautiful garden from heaven. And that's him there now. He will stay in the cupboard, in the grave. And it's a garden from the garden, gardens of heaven. And the, the Nurani creature says to him that, look, this is not it. Now, on the day of resurrection, when the trumpet is blown, I'm going to be with you. We're going to go together towards the scales where your good deeds and bad deeds are measured. I'm going to be with you. On the bridge of Sirat, I will be with you. All the way until you reach inside heaven, I'm going to be with you. And this is that person who reads the Quran. And now every day up until the day of judgment, this Quranic creature that Allah has sent for that person who reads the Quran, he comes to his grave every other day. One day he says to him, your, your, your cat has passed away. One day this Nurani creature says to him that your son is reading the Quran or your son was involved in an accident. So now he gets daily reports of what's going on in the dunya from this Nurani creature. That's what you call a true blessing. Imagine that. That's what you call a true friend. A true friend is this Quranic creature that comes into your grave and helps you out. 
And this is why we honor this month because the Quran was revealed in this month. We respect this month for that reason. That's why we fast in this month. That's one that you know the Quran. But how many of us is not even just reading the Quran? How many of us actually understand this? How many of us actually know any sort of depth of the Quran? You know, if for example, if the Queen Queen wrote you a letter, but the letters in Chinese, for example. You're going to try and learn Chinese, eh? based on Bob, because you want to know what the Queen has wrote to you directly. The Allah has sent the Quran in Arabic. And as a Muslim, you know, if your creator, someone who's created you, the one who's created you, the most powerful, the one who makes kings into kings, if he has given you a book, said, here, read this. You'll get 10 good deeds for each letter you read. That's just the start of it. And we still don't read that book. We still do not even learn Arabic. That's sad, isn't it? We, even the Arabic we read in our salah, if we do not even know that. That's sad, isn't it? The, you know what, when we read Surah Fatiha, the way we converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Fatiha is part of the Quran. Some people ask, how do you concentrate in salah? The answer is, learn what you are reading in salah. Simple answer. Learn what you're saying. You concentrate. Simple. But for the youngsters here, for the elders, Learning the Quran, this is part of our Muslim life, you know, education, Islamic education. And Islamic education is that thing that makes a Muslim a Muslim, a true Muslim, if he's got Islamic education. A Muslim with no Islamic education is not the strong Muslim. He has to have education. That's what, that's what a Muslim is. A powerful Muslim is someone with education. You will never find a Muslim that is uneducated Islamically. That's a strong Muslim. You will never find a wali, a peer, a saint. That's not a scholar. That's not, you know, doesn't have Islamic knowledge. You won't find that. For the youngsters here and the elders, look, Dawud Islami offers alim course part time. Offers alim course full time, part time for the ones that are under 18, full time for the ones over 16, five days a week, free of charge. But, and not even far from you, I've come from Rochdale to here, took me, I shouldn't say, 25 minutes. It's not that far, these, you know, these uh, countryside roads, They're nice to drive on as well. Rochdale is your close Jamia. Well, one of your closes. I don't know how close Blackburn is from here. But sign up to one of these Jamia Tul Madinas. Put your application in. And start an Alim course. And then see how it changes your life. Then see the spirituality you have. May Allah Azza give us the ability to remember and act upon what has been said. May he give us the ability to uh, remember, act upon, and then convey this to other people as well. Amin bijahin nabiyyin. Sallu ala al-habib.